Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Cook. Wanted to welcome you to our webinar on how to build location intelligence into your economic development strategy. Um, I'm the planning and community development industry manager here at Esri. And uh, just wanted to, first of all, thank you first and foremost for your time. I know that uh, I know that you're all busy. You have other demands on your time. So carving out an hour to, to spend with us um, I mean, something else is, is getting pushed to the side. So we very much uh, appreciate your time. And, uh, and, and I think the resources that we're going to be able to provide you and really the insight um, on location intelligence and economic development is really going to be worth it. I think you're, I think you're going to enjoy this. Joining me today is uh, Destin Wells from, he's the vice president at, uh, for the Economic Development Corporation of Sarasota County, Florida. Um, you'll hear from him later on today. It's great. It's a great presentation. And I always love seeing users being able to show it. I think it's always better than me showing it. Um, so it, that's, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this again. Uh, and then joining us from GIS Web Tech, we have Ron Bertanzi and Mike, uh, Michael Cleary. And uh, if you're not familiar, GIS Web Tech is a, um, uh, an integral business partner of ours uh, at Esri on the economic development space. Uh, they have grown exponentially over the last several years, and for good reason, and you're going to see why uh, in just a little bit. Um, but just to give you an idea of what we're going to be doing today, we're going to, um, I'm going to give an overview of location intelligence, because sometimes that can seem like a slightly ambiguous term. It's like, I, I think I know what that means, but, um, and we'll put a little bit, uh, we'll provide a little bit more clarity to that. Um, Ron's going to take you through a survey where we're going to kind of get a feel for the audience's, um, the attendees' uh, knowledge and use of geospatial technology as a whole within their organization. Uh, Michael will also get on and talk a little bit about uh, set up uh, Destin's presentation. And then, as I mentioned, he'll be, uh, Destin will be getting on and showing you um, uh, how they use this in Sarasota County, really to provide them a very competitive advantage, and you're going to see why in just a little bit. All right, so with that, uh, let's go ahead and move forward. So as I mentioned, my role here at Esri is uh, as the planning and community development industry manager. My background is in planning uh, and economic development, so did that for many years. So let's talk about what this means. So let's talk about this first from the standpoint of what really is lo what is location intelligence. Um, it's it's not necessarily traditional GIS, and so the reason I put this up here is to help provide a little bit more context. Think of location intelligence as the ability to carve out certain components from traditional GIS and to be able to use it in a web-based or a mobile-based environment to be able to answer specific questions about your data. Um, so when I see this a lot, where I see this a lot, I should say, in um, uh, in planning, it's on the permitting side, where a lot of times the output for a permitting system is a database, and then it's just got a list of rows of here are the available, uh, here are the permits that are ongoing, right? Here are the ones that are about to expire. And likewise, you could see this like in an MLS listing, right? Being able just to see a list. Well, this provides location intelligence, and not just in points on a map, but actually be able to provide analysis around that data as well, right? So we're Traditional GIS is not going away, but what this means is that you don't have to have, you know, a beefy desktop uh, machine to be able to use, um, to leverage location intelligence from these geospatial tools. Uh, if you're not familiar with Forrester, they're an American uh, market research company, and they provide uh, advice on, on the impact uh, of existing and potential uh, technology to both their clients and to the public. And one of the out products that they output is uh, called the Forrester Way, which you may have heard of, where they identify these different uh, companies and different solutions, and, and they identify where their leaders are. And Esri has been listed as a leader in the location intelligence platform. This is based on both our strategy and the existing functionality. And so functionality now and where we're going down the road. Um, the experience within the platform for users, again, made for not GIS professionals, but for economic development professionals. And then our support ecosystem, which has to do with not just our ability to support it, but also having uh, really great partners like GIS WebTech 
uh, to be able to, to come in and, and provide additional solutions and build upon that technology. The reason why this is important is that economic developers today have to have more than site selection. I've said this many times at, at, at trade shows and so forth. It's like, let's, if, you, if the only thing you think of in, when you think GIS is site selection and just showing your available sites and buildings, I would submit to you that that's, that's good, that's a component, but it's not the only thing that differentiates you because everyone else has available sites and buildings too. So how do you tell that complete story, right? How do you brand your destination successfully? And the thing to keep in mind also is that with this location intelligence and GIS, um, the companies that you're trying to recruit and retain and expand, they've been using this technology for years as well, right? So this helps create a, a successful and sustainable uh, economic development policy. And all of this really starts with having access to data. And many of you will have data that you can use locally, and that's great, and you absolutely should use that. That's authoritative. But Esri also provides additional data through the Living Atlas, and I put the URL up here, and, and we'll make sure to make that available to you uh, in the chat window and so forth. But this is nationally and actually internationally available data um, to be able to see things like how much revenue is at risk if an economic downturn uh, occurs for, for vulnerable uh, vulnerable businesses. Um, how expensive is the cost of living in a certain location? Where is there a higher percentage of restaurants and bars, right? So this is data that can complement your data, not, not really replace it, but to be able to complement it. And then once we have that data in place, we can use, uh, we see repeating patterns emerging, like in a very simple app in Leon County, Florida, which is uh, Tallahassee. Um, where they were able to identify restaurants, you know, and again, this was in the face of the, the early days of the pandemic, being able to identify here are the restaurants that are open, right, for, um, for carry out, for, for delivery, and here are the ones that are close to you, right? Um, uh, City of uh, uh, San Rafael, California helped to identify um, their most disadvantaged businesses and, and understand which ones were most vulnerable. In Valley County, Idaho, they allowed uh, business owners to be able to complete a survey to show how their business was being their business was being impacted, and so this helped decision makers understand where resources needed to go. And one of the more one of the trends that we've been seeing, and this actually was going on well before the COVID pandemic, but definitely in terms of uh, from an economic development standpoint, is this emergence, really a proliferation of dashboards, and we're seeing this to again to be able to tell the story to the public. Uh, and administrators. So uh, showing uh, in Bozeman, Montana, which actually covers three different counties, breaking out in each county how federal funds are being used, where businesses are struggling, uh, where additional resources are headed. In Cobb County, Georgia, how they're using um, identifying where businesses are hiring and helping businesses understand where their customers would be and so forth, and many other examples out there of this. Again, to me, the, the benefit here is that um, we're able to take both a very tactical and a strategic approach by leveraging location intelligence. So site selection is part of it, absolutely, and you're going to see some of that, but it's really site selection plus a whole lot more, right? Because we're doing we're taking the process, undertaking the process of destination branding. The story is, why do I want to live here? Why do I want to work here? Uh, why do I want to, to locate a business here? And so all of these different web apps um, allow you to be able to leverage location intelligence in terms of understanding where and who to recruit. What would my plan redevelopment look like if we were to locate a business here? What would be the impact of that proposed development, both in terms of jobs and economic and, I mean, or uh, environmental and traffic and so forth? Uh, if I'm doing a mixed use development, how many people am I adding in addition to jobs? And being able to, over, over all of that, being able to model policy by that, to be able to justify, here's why we want to pr propose development in this area, right? This is why this area is better than this and so forth. And again, that's leveraging location intelligence and not just traditional uh, GIS to make that happen. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Ron. He's going to run through a survey, and I think there's some really, uh, I'm looking forward, Ron, to seeing the, the answers to some of these questions. Great, thank you, Keith. And uh, I'm not gonna turn my video on because I want the survey to take up your whole screen. And the purpose of the survey is to get some real-time data 
what we'd like to do now is just take a couple of minutes to provide some quick questions to you. We'd ask that you uh, who are attending the webinar answer the survey. And what we'll, we'll do is during the course of the remaining time, particularly you know, the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, we will compile the results and present them at the end. So we wanna give you real time data on how your peers are using GIS technology today. So I'll walk you through the survey. And again, just please answer as we go along. So the first question is an obvious one. Do you or your organization currently use a public facing online GIS app for economic development? And this is meant to include really any type of GIS app that you're using provided it's public facing. Simple yes, no question. Okay, so if you're not using one, if you're interested in using one, please select yes. If you're not, go ahead and select no. And then the next question is, if you are using one, do you incorporate layers from local GIS departments? And examples would be sewer layers, water layers, infrastructure like that, zoning layers, parcel layers, parks and recreation layers, trail layers, any examples like that. If you currently have a GIS app that you use public facing, do you incorporate these local layers into that app? Okay. Next survey question is, if you've got a GIS app, but you're not incorporating those local layers, why aren't you doing so? And here are the options. Is it because you don't know what's available, you haven't to talked to your local GIS department, you're just not sure what's out there? Is it that you don't know how to integrate those into your GIS app? In other words, you know your local GIS department, maybe at the city or the county, has zoning data, and you'd love to integrate that, but you're just not sure how to do it? Third option is, yeah, it's out there, but you really hate dealing with shapefiles. It's too much of a hassle to go ask them to produce shapefiles, email them to you, and then you have to deal with it and hope they'll work properly. And have to do that again next year when those files get updated. So that's a third option. You know it's out there, but you just don't have to deal with it. Uh, and then the fourth option is, you know, you've tried this in the past perhaps, but in any case, you don't think it's worth doing because when you get that shapefile produced by the GIS department, it becomes out of date. They add another, um, sewer line if it's a sewer layer or they change the zoning if it's a zoning layer. So you don't bother with this because you've done this or you've looked into it and the shape files are just going to become out of date. And then last option is if you've got some other reason for not including those local layers. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. So independent of the layers already built by your local GIS departments, do you have local data you'd like to display in a GIS app? Examples could be industry clusters. Perhaps you've got local industry strengths you want to highlight. Uh, they could be labor studies. Perhaps you've done a study of your local labor, for, labor force uh, with, in partnership with local government. Could be workforce training programs. You've got local educational institutions, community colleges, and so on, and you want to highlight the, the skilled labor that they produce. Could be local incentive districts. Really, any local data with a spatial component do you have some of that that you would like to display in your app? Okay, and the last question is when responding to RFIs, inbound inquiries you get from businesses or site selectors, do you currently follow a process where you typically have to assemble data from multiple sources? And this could be property listings from one source, workforce data from another source, demographic data from a third source, et cetera. Okay, so what we'll do now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the quick survey we just completed, is we'll compile the data, we'll present it to you at the end to give you a sense of how your peers are using GIS today. Okay, so we'll come back to it at the end of the session. So what we'll talk about next on the agenda is a, a brief overview of GIS apps for economic development. Uh, we're not gonna get into a lot of detail, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And Natalie or Michael, can you confirm that you're seeing uh, the, the correct screen? I do, I see everyone. Okay, thank you. Great, so what you're seeing on the screen now is a live installation uh, of, of our technology for the EDC of Sarasota County. And what we wanna do is just show you some of the features of modern GIS apps. GIS apps for economic development have been around a long time, but they've greatly improved in the last three or four years. Hey, bro. Yeah. I see, uh, yeah, there you go. Q there we go, sorry, I had the wrong one on. 
Okay, so as I mentioned, they've been they've been around for a while, but they've greatly improved the last few years. And the first thing you note about GIS apps for economic development is that they all feature property listings. And in fact, modern apps for economic development provide more advanced property search features than even commercial real estate apps. I won't go through them in the interest of time, but you can see in the upper left-hand side of the screen, there's over a dozen uh, abil uh, filters and search options to look at properties and find properties that make sense for a particular user. Now, a user can also quickly scroll the property listings you know, without ever having to hit a next button. So modern technologies use this feature called an infinite scroll, where the software actually loads properties as fast as you scroll. So you never need to worry about hitting a next button. Modern apps also include a full set of demographic data. And that demographic data, when I click on the link here at the top of the screen, provides access in real time to the entire Esri data set. So up-to-date GIS apps for economic development provide this type of data. And they really find a proper balance between breadth and depth of data and ease of use. So the breadth of data, the depth of data are here for those who want it. But as you can see, it's organized into a simple and icon-driven menu. So it's very easy to use. And these data sets include not just traditional census-driven data, but actually quite a lot of business and economic data, allowing users, for example, to find concentrations of manufacturers or to find concentrations of consumers with particular spending behavior. Similarly, modern apps also include a full set of workforce data. So I'll click on workforce and I now have access to two digit occupational code data, allowing users to see visually on the map where the density or where the concentrations are of um, particular skill sets that they're looking for. Up-to-date apps also provide advanced analytical tools. These allow a user to drop a pin, draw a shape, or select a property, and from that location, gather data within drive times, trucking times, or walking times. So I selected custom reports at the top of the screen. You can see the pin icon. I can select pin, I can drop a pin, and now I have the ability to look at data within drive times, trucking times, walking times, et cetera. Importantly, up-to-date apps allow the user to customize drive times to reflect real life. In other words, they can take traffic into account. They can look at data for days of the week, times of day, and directions of travel that they select. And this allows for very precise analysis, far more precise than a simple average drive time which the older technologies used to provide. Okay, last thing I wanna mention about up-to-date GIS apps is that they allow the inclusion of local data by connecting directly with the source files through the Esri platform. In other words, there's never a need to email shape files around. Let me now hand it over to Michael Cleary, who's gonna give a quick overview of the linkage between a modern GIS app and the Esri platform. Uh, thank you, Ron. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. And let me take the screen. Okay, uh, Ron, can you confirm if you can see Sarasota? Yep, looks great. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so the combination of Recruit with Esri's ArcGIS Online and Business Analysts is perfectly complementary and truly offers the best data and analytical tools available to economic development organizations. In our opinion, this is the evolution for economic development. In the form of layers, right here, Recruit takes advantage of data that other organizations create and maintain in Esri's RGIS. These organizations include authoritative sources, such as states, counties, cities, utilities, departments of transportation, FEMA, SBA, and many, many more. And this is what Keith mentioned earlier. Literally, there are millions of layers maintained in RGIS, and we have access to them. Plus, as Dustin will share with you, clients can create their own layers in RGS Online and add it to Recruit. So these are the layers category. These are categories, and here are layers. Let's talk a little bit about this. So categories are configurable by the client. This means the client can decide the order of the categories, edit a category name, they can add a category, and make a category active or inactive. Layers. These are the layers, are assigned to categories. Layers are configurable by the client. This whole module is configurable by the client. 
Uh, this means the client decide which layers are added to recruit, which categories the layers are assigned. If you wanted to put bus stops under recreation, you could do that. Um, it's also the order of the layers within the category and if the layers are available for public or private access. So let's take a look. I'm gonna turn my properties off. I'm gonna look at a layer for parks. And then let's click on that polygon. And this shows relevant data that is perfect for your target audience. This is how Dustin configured his layers and his categories. Here's another one, water main lines. Let's turn off parks and let's zoom in. Let's click on, click on the line. Here's more data. This is a distribution line for potable or potable water. It's made of polyvinyl chloride and it's 12 inches in diameter, owned and maintained by Sarasota County. Very important authoritative door, uh, data. And as you all know, presentation matters, especially when your prospects are making quick assessments to create their shortlist. In our experience, clients know best how to present the data to tell the story of their community. This is why we enable clients to add layers and categories and configure them in the way that targets their target audience in perfect alignment with their economic development strategy. The results, well, clients have consistently told us that by offering more local, relevant, and authoritative data, our clients have reduced risk and uncertainty in the prospect's decision-making process. And this is a critical think advantage for our clients. So I quickly just shared with you the who, the what, and the how, no, the why, excuse me. So now let's pivot to the how. Categories and layers are maintained and managed in a community layers module inside Recruit's administrative panel. So let's go there now for a quick tour. This is the community layers module. It is intuitive and user-friendly, allowing clients to easily manage categories and layers, okay? Layers are added to recruit through this portal, which we created that connects directly to ESRI's ArcGIS Align. This revolutionary approach allows clients to decide what data is added to recruit, and adding layers to recruit literally takes seconds. Here is ArcGIS Align. Uh, earlier, Keith had mentioned the Living Atlas, and here is relevant data uh, for infrastructure for the Living Atlas, and all this data can be added to recruit. The, the opportunities and options are, are virtually limitless. An important feature to note is when layers are added to recruit, the layers remain connected to the authoritative data source. So an example is, let's go back to parks. We looked at parks, and then we looked at the water main lines. So what I mean by that is, when the authoritative source updates their data in ArcGIS, guess what? It's automatically updated here, okay? No one needs to update the layer and recruit. This saves you and your organization time and more important, unnecessary worry about having relevant data to target your prospect and promote your community. The last item I'd like to share, and I'll do it very quickly, is business analyst. So here is business analyst, and here is the county of Sarasota. I won't go too much into depth and detail, but in business, in business analysts, there's just a treasure trove of data and analytical tools and reports. From here, we can do things such as run an analysis. Here you can do a suitability analysis or a void analysis. Uh, here you can pinpoint areas where there's a gap for a particular business or market category. Just a wonderful analytical tool to identify opportunities for prospects. You can also run reports. So here uh, in reports, there is a set of templated infographics and templated classic reports, which are available within Recruit. But also you can build your own reports and you can customize your reports. Uh, here is a sample of a demographic, or excuse me, infographic report we simply ran for Sarasota County. This is configurable for uh, the data categories as well as the colors. And it comes in a PDF or uh, an image, and also as a HTML, which can be embedded inside your website. Well, the final key point I wanna make here, the data in Recruit is perfectly consistent with the data in RJS Align and Business Analyst. There's no need to worry about, is the data consistent? 
Is it stale? It never is. It's always perfectly consistent. For a deeper dive on this and more, it's my pleasure to introduce Dustin Wells to offer the economic developer's perspective. Dustin has been with Sarasota since 2017. Sarasota County and Destin were recently featured in Site Selection Magazine where Sarasota was recognized as the number one city to launch a small business. Before his current role, Destin was the Director of Aviation, Aerospace and Defense for Enterprise Florida, where he worked projects that resulted in over 10,000 jobs and 1.6 billion in capital investment. Welcome, Destin. Great, well, thank you. Michael, I'm going to share my screen here so everyone can see what we have going on. All right. Are we seeing recruit on the screen here? Yes, we are. Fantastic. All right. Well, well first off, thank you, everyone that's, that's on the webinar, um, taking time out of your day. Hopefully, you'll find this uh, somewhat helpful. I'm Dustin Wells, VP at the EDC of Sarasota County. Um, we, you know, I, I want to start off by talking about what this really boils down to, wh wh which is storytelling. You know, recruit uh, is really, and any data for that matter, is only as good as the story behind it and how you're communicating it. And so what I want to talk to everyone today is, is show a couple of use cases. Um, I've been working with, with Ron and Michael since, since pretty early on, and uh, I, I like to kind of play the role of guinea pig. Um, so you're always looking for ways to push the the boundaries of recruit, uh, find new use cases and ways that we can draw value out of this uh, and really you know, squeeze every bit of the juice from that, that orange as we can. So um, today I'm gonna focus on three key components of our storytelling in recruit um, and, and how the benefit of, of enhancing recruit to include business analysts and all the ArcGIS integrations has really improved our competitiveness, our storytelling, and, and the degree of information we're providing to both people in the community, prospects that might be considering uh, Sarasota County, and any number of other uses. So that's how to bring in a layer, how to customize a layer, and, and finally taking a look at some of those infographic reports that Michael just showed, um, and just you know sharing with you the use case there. So. So let's dive in. You know, as Michael was kind of going through, they've they've taken all my fun stuff, right? You know, going to the map and showing some of the customizations. But um, Sarasota County, you know, when we first got recruit, it was preloaded with a number of layers that were fairly standard and fairly interesting. Um, but obviously, our story is is much bigger than that. Um, I will say that we are very fortunate in Sarasota County. Our county uh, government does have a GIS department that does phenomenal work, created all kinds of really powerful layers that we were able to go in and, and bring into our solution and enhance the storytelling, the data, and what was available. Um, now, when we first started on that journey of bringing in additional layers, um, it was a bit clunky, to, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I would need to work uh, through the GIS department at the county, I would need to work with, with Ron and Michael and, and really try to figure out how to best make sure that the solution was reflective of, of the stories and the data that was preferred. Um, what Enhancing Recruit has done, it's brought those abilities in-house. I now have the ability to go into my solution and change things on the drop of a dime. I don't need to call anyone else. And, and incredibly importantly, I am not a GIS expert. In fact, I would be considered rather uh, a novice um so this is not something that you need if, as long as you're willing to take five minutes to google search to watch a youtube video uh michael has been incredibly responsive he even produced a video for me on, on creating some of my custom layers um so it's a pretty it's it's a pretty easy and short learning curve uh, to really get the value out so let me show you just a couple of layers you saw the parks you saw the water mains all really important stuff you know the water mains for example if you're responding to an rfp you know i've gone down the rabbit hole of trying to contact a utility and get you know what what is the uh the water line going into a particular site or things of that nature well now i don't need to call anyone i have that information you know right at my fingertips and that's been incredibly helpful 
Uh, and that was a layer that the county already had. Other layers that the county had that we've found to be very helpful and valuable, uh, zoning, future land use, you know, really telling the story of, of what's going on in the community, where is business, where's the residential, you know, all the different things. And in each one of the polygons, you're able to have an incredible amount of information. Now, when you bring in a layer from the county or from some third party, you are kind of stuck with this table that they that they provide. If you bring in their layer exactly, you do have the ability to clone a layer to customize it for some of your uh, storytelling. But I will I will forewarn you that if you do that, Michael is mentioning the link to the data and to the layer that maintains uh, as you move forward. If you create a if you clone a layer to customize it and to include information that you find more impactful here that data linkage is broken and it won't be automatically updated. So you would need to think about some form of data maintenance schedule to address that. Um, and I'll show you some examples of, of that. Zoning, I mean, this even gets down to, as long as you get close enough, let's see. We can even activate things such as our parcel data and get very, very specific. In fact, there you go. You now all know where I live. So bringing in these layers was all rather simple, uh, done through uh, the, the enhancement of recruit through uh, ArcGIS. So to show you an example of this, here's my, I log in, and this is, I just wanna kind of demonstrate to you how quick, easy, and simple this really is. Now, when I come in, I'm logging in, I'm gonna search, I'm just gonna search for my county, Sarasota County, and see what comes up. I have to toggle a few things. These are ones that I've either customized or created. So I don't want to see just my stuff. I'm looking for everyone's. And I only want to see future layers. So you can see up here that I have 247 layers specific to Sarasota County at my fingertips, ready to, should it be compelling and tell a good story, integrate that into my solution uh, very easily. And you can see the different types. Some of them, the, the quality depends greatly upon who created it. Some of those 247, honestly, are layers that I have created. Um, but again, we see uh, you know, th this Sarco, Sarasota County, uh, that's our GIS folks. So we, we do have a lot of great information that they've already uh, provided for us. But here's a use case that actually we just ran into. We just did this uh, not but a week ago. Uh, we had a, a, we're doing some land and site development work in Sarasota County. And the uh, consultant that's taken a look was curious about our county owned parcels um, and how we might be able to look at those for suitability and see if they work um, for future development. So fortunately, again, Sarasota County has a great layer. So I was able to go in and grab this layer very quickly and easily. As Michael mentioned, there's a, here's my administrative panel. In Recruit, bringing in a new layer is very user-friendly, is very simple. You can search from Recruit itself, from the administrative panel. And you'll see a lot of the similarities. I can search Sarasota County. If I can learn how to type And again, here's those 247 different layers. I've already loaded most of these into my solution, um, but again, these are all ones I can go and grab. Now, the way I actually do it, you see this ID equals, this number here is actually the identifier of this layer. So I've done it to where I come in and I will copy and paste that layer ID it comes up, here's the county surplus lands. You can check it, preview it, make sure. And I'm gonna save it. That layer is now loaded into my solution. So now all I need to do, I'm having some trouble with my screen. There we go. All I have to do is scroll down to the bottom. You can see I have 120 layers loaded up. If I scroll down to the bottom, here's that layer that I just pulled in. I'm going to assign it to a category, and I'm going to make sure it's turned on. 
And as simple as that, I'm able to go back, refresh my solution. Let's refresh the refresh. It wouldn't be a true webinar without some kind of technology hiccup. You can say that again. It always happens. And there we are. All right. So now if I go into my, I have my county owned surplus lands. If I scroll out, we'll see where those lands are. We have a good degree of information on any given one. And I'm able to share this directly with my consultant who now gets to run his models analysis across all of our different county owned parcels. So bringing in a layer is very easy. Uh, after you get a hang of it, that first one or two you bring in might take you a couple minutes. After that point, honestly, it's, it's seconds. Um, so now pivoting over to, that, that's a layer that exists that I brought into my solution to help my storytelling. So now let's go to how do I make some customized layers? There's a lot of times that you're gonna go in there and find that that story doesn't exist for you. Um, some of the ways we've done this, for example, is in our top companies. We wanted people to be able to have that virtual experience and understand where some of our top companies, best and brightest are. So we broke them out by industry sector and you are able to very quickly go through the map and see where these companies are. Additionally, we have the ability to customize any and all the information that is presented about them. So now you can say what sector, the company description, we link off to their web pages so people can quickly get a see of who exactly they are and really learn more about them. Contact information, how many employees. And this is a really quick and easy way to kind of show off some of your companies uh, and give a little bit more flavor from an industry standpoint, what your community is about. To create these custom layers, this is all you have to do. It's a, it's a CSV file um, with the proper headers on it. And integrating this into Recruit is really a simple, again, Michael generated about a five minute video for me, didn't even have audio on it. Um, and it was perfectly sufficient to get me to understand how to create, upload and maintain custom layers. Uh, so that's been a huge boon to our storytelling. And I, you know, these layers, the flexibility you have in them is really incredible. Um, a sneak peek of where we're taking our solution. We're going to be having, you know, we're going to put in layers for our business parks. We're going to film 360 video so that as you click on a business park, you can actually drive down the main drag and look around and see the employers and what that layout and what it all looks like. Um, if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that we need to be nimble. Uh, that we need to be innovative and forward thinking in how we're telling our story and, and, and giving people the opportunities to experience our communities in perhaps a different way uh, than they did before. So that's custom layers and that's bringing in layers that existed. Um, I'm gonna pivot quickly over to business analyst. Uh, so business analyst, when we talk about storytelling with data, this is really the vehicle that I find incredibly effective for it. Um, you're able to generate and customize infographic reports to the nth degree. Uh, in fact, if there is an infographic or if there is a, a data point that doesn't exist, you can create that set or that chart of data and upload it into your infographics as well. I'd like to show you an example of how we've used this. We turn in quarterly reports to our county and to the municipalities and honestly to the public um, in Sarasota County. So part of our reporting, we now integrate standardized infographic reports. We, we generated this. Um, and when I say generated it, organized it, chose which data points, chose which icons, uh, things of that nature. Not necessarily making up our own unemployment rates or anything like that, but um, you, you have all this customization. Once that template is built, it is there. It is there forever. All you have to do to refresh it is go click run again. And as soon as that, that next available data set comes out to update these, you now have click button intelligence reports. Um, and think of the efficiencies that creates for your research team. And again, the sophistication of your storytelling. 
Now, when we did ours, we actually ran it for each of the municipalities in the county, as well as the county as a whole. And, and we really learned uh, you know, some really interesting insights that I'm three years in Sarasota County. Um, I talk to you know, the business community all day, every day. And, and yet three years later, by simply running a report like this, I actually learned some things about the community um, that I did not know before. It dispelled certain myths that some in the community might tell. Um, I don't know if any of them are on the webinar and if they are, I apologize, but our fastest growing community, at least by claim, per the data, not our fastest growing community. Um, our average age really told a story. Average age in Sarasota County is a big deal. You look at our median age for the county, 56.7, you know, for, for economic development, for businesses, you know, that could be a bit of a, a cause some hesitation. But as we were able to go down into some of the municipalities, well, we saw that we are a community that really has some segmentation going on, whether that be, you know, from, from an age standpoint, certainly. Um, so the intelligence we've learned out of this, the customized ability uh, to generate these types of reports has been infinitely helpful and impactful for ourselves. Our commission, this informs our county commission and, and some of the decisions they're making and ultimately tells the story of Sarasota County in a more impactful and meaningful way. Um, with that, unless you wanna go through some more layers, I'm going to yield the time back and appreciate everyone's attention um, and happy to answer some questions a bit later on uh, regarding some bar experiences and, and use case around recruit. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dustin, that was terrific. Um, I just wanna take a second, we've covered a lot quickly, we have a few more topics to, to go through, and I'm gonna pull up my screen as we're talking. But I wanna remind everyone that if you've got questions, please feel free to submit them through the chat function. We're going to log them and we'll come back to them at the end and answer your questions. So a couple quick topics uh, before we get to the questions. First, we're gonna look at uh, one final example of local data. That's what you should see on your screen in front of you now. I'll get to it in a second. And then we're gonna go through our survey results, which we have compiled and we're ready to share with you. So let's take a look at a very timely example of local data that up-to-date GIS apps include. And these are 3D layers and 3D media. These are the things that allow you to provide a full experience in a virtual site visit. And Destin is an example of an economic development uh, leader in this area who's taking advantage of this. Now, virtual site visits are an idea whose time has come, and with COVID, they have really taken off. But there is some confusion on what constitutes a virtual site visit out there. That's a whole separate topic. We're not going to get into that in detail today. And if you'd like to learn more, simply go to our blog at our website, giswebtech.com, and you can find lots of good information on virtual site visits. But let's take a look at two of the critical components of local data that enable a virtual site visit, 3D layers and 3D media. 3D layers allow you to provide the full 3D experience for the exterior of a building. What you see on the screen here is an example of a 3D layer we created for a proposed business park development for a client in South Carolina. 3D layers are easy to build using Esri tools and can range from simple imagery to photorealistic imagery. I'm gonna to move to a second example which contains a mix of both simple imagery in the form of proposed buildings, which you see in blue, and photorealistic imagery for the ballpark and some surrounding buildings in this development in Atlanta. So these 3D layers allow you to take control in an online meeting and host a virtual site visit, giving a full experience of the exterior space. But it's also critical to show interior space in 3D. And what you see on the screen now is an example of a 3D photo, a 3D image that allows you to highlight critical interior space in a virtual meeting, a virtual site visit, and really showcase that space. Now a 3D video would be even more compelling of this 3D image, but the technology allows you to include both. And in summary, 3D really is no longer an option. It's increasingly expected as the move to virtual site visits because of the pandemic is really becoming permanent in the site selection process. Okay, I'm gonna pause sharing for a second. And I'm gonna load the survey res results and we'll go ahead and jump to the survey results. Okay, so let me go ahead and start sharing again. 
So uh, Michael or Natalie, can you confirm that you're seeing the survey results on the screen? I can confirm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we put these together very quickly during the course of the discussion. You'll notice down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see category one. We didn't bother to clean up the slide so perfectly such that that was deleted, but you get the idea. So here's our first question. Does your organization use a public facing online GIS app for economic development? Uh, and it's about, it's pretty evenly split. Uh, most of the attendees today do not use one, a little, little more than half, but it's pretty evenly split. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Oops, sorry, I went ahead one slide too many. Here we are. If you're not using one, if the answer is no, are you interested in using one? Overwhelmingly, people are interested in these apps as they see the technology evolving. If you are using one, do you incorporate layers from local GIS departments such as sewer, water, zoning, parcels, parks? I mentioned a few other layers when we actually did the survey. And so people who are using these apps are including local data. That really it shouldn't be a surprise. 71%, about three quarters are including that today. As Destin highlighted in a very compelling way, local data is what's gonna help you tell your story. So if you're going to use a GIS app, which, was, which we would argue is increasingly required in economic development site selection, uh, it makes sense to include local data. Okay, if you use a GIS app, but you don't incorporate layers from local GIS departments, why not? Well, we gave some potential answers here and allowed people to select. 30% don't know what's available from the local GIS departments. That would be city, county, utility departments, et cetera. 15% don't know how to integrate the layers. They know there's something out there, but don't know how to incorporate them. 3% have tried this and hate dealing with shapefiles. That should, sh should say hate dealing with shapefiles, not hate feeling with shapefiles. Again, we put this together in real time during the presentation without any time to review it. We would have caught that, although I will admit that is a pretty funny typo. And then about 6% uh, I think there's no point to including them since the shape files become out of date anyway. So if you combine that 3% and the 6%, that's 9% have some experience in doing this. It has not been a pleasant or, or good experience for them. And then 45% are not including them for another reason. That's a pretty big number. Uh, so we would be interested in, in digging into that 45% and understanding why people are not including them for reasons not listed here. So if any of you who answered other in this survey question want to comment in the chat function on why you are not using local GIS data in your GIS apps, please feel free to do so and we'll include that in our, in our Q&A discussion. All right, independent of layers already built by local GIS departments, do you have local data you'd like to display in a GIS app? And you can see on the screen here, overwhelmingly the answer is yes. 90% of the folks said, yeah, I've got data. I'd like to include it again. Uh, it comes back to Destin's key point, or one of Destin's key points, which is local data really is what allows you to tell your story and differentiate your community. And the last question, when responding to RFIs, do you currently assemble data from multiple sources? For example, property listings from one source, workforce data from another, demographic data from a third, and just about everybody is, uh, over 90% are currently gathering data from multiple sources, only 8% are not. This suggests that that is overwhelmingly the norm. And one of the benefits of modern GIS apps used on in an integrated fashion, as we've talked about today, is you have a single source for data. Okay, let's pause for a second. Uh, what we'd love to do now, I'm gonna stop sharing. We'd love to go to the Q&A. We've gotten some, I believe we've gotten some questions through the chat box. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask Michael uh, sure. to take the lead on answering the Q&A. And I'm not sure, Natalie, if, if uh, he's gonna need to see the chat uh, Q&A you received or if he has access to it directly. Got it, man. Okay, thank you. You got it. Okay, so, um, so thank you everyone. Great questions in here. And the first one really goes to Dustin. So Dustin, you trust briefly on this. Uh, it's not surprised it's asked again. I am not a technical person. So how easy was it to use? Talk about training. Sure. Um, so there was a, a litany of resources provided when I first uh, you know, decided to push forward with business analysts and ArcGIS. Um, to be honest with you, it was, it was overwhelming. I mean, it was so much information. And um, 
I, I am a learn by doing person. So to be completely honest with you, I just started getting in there and clicking around. And, and again, I am not a, a techie by any stretch of the imagination. Um, about, let's call it an hour of doing that. And I had pretty good, you know, handle of the functionalities and how to integrate layers or things of that nature. Um, outside of that, Michael and I have had a number of conversations. I think you add them all up, we'll call it maybe a couple hours. Um, the five minute video he sent, but really it was, I found it incredibly user-friendly, intuitive. Um, I would not, I personally would not recommend anyone's hesitation over their own technical abilities be the limiting factor here. It's, it's extremely user-friendly uh, to bring to bear to your, your solution. Yeah, thank you, Dustin. And and so Dustin uh, is a what we'll call a thought leader in the marketplace, and uh, he is spot on about his technical capabilities. No, just just kidding, Dustin. But we do <laughs> offer <laughs> we, we we do working with Esri. Uh, Esri has created a training module for us that takes it from the very fundamental what is ArcGIS and what is business analyst. Up, up through someone with more tech, technical expertise. And that continues to get updated as materials update. And also as Dustin shared, we do cut videos, simple five minute or less videos to spe specific applications to connect or create data within RGS line, bring it to recruit. As an example, we created the uh, video for him, how to add, uh, CSV into recruit to create those layers. So thank you, Justin. Uh, next question is for Ron. I don't have an Esri license. Uh, you know, what are the steps to get this license? Uh, this great question. Uh, there's a, a couple different uh, ways we can do this. We're happy to work with you. Simply reach out to either Keith or to me or Courtney Bridger or Michael Cleary at GIS Web Tech. We'll share our contact information for all of today's panelists at the end of the session. And we'll talk you through it. It's it's very simple and straightforward. So uh, we have a couple more questions here. We won't get to all the questions because of the time limit, but we assure you we will respond to all the questions post the meeting. This one's for Destin. Destin, can you share a success story of how these materials were used to pitch and recruit a new business to your district? Sure, sure. I, I appreciate that question, and it, it kind of clues off a, an entire component uh, that I failed to to mention and share with everyone. And that's within those infographic reports uh, and the customization, there's comparison reports. Uh, so you can choose different markets uh, and basically run some of those infographics and, and comparisons very quickly and very easily. Um, we've found that to be really impactful, both from a learning perspective. Um, you know, say we, we have a certain market that we've identified as having high potential. They have a high concentration of our targeted industry sector. Um, the business case, you know, on on its you know, face looks pretty good. You know, we'll go ahead and we'll run some of these reports, these infographic reports, um, see what intelligence we learn out of that, where the competitive advantages are, um, and then we craft that and include that when we're in markets, meeting with companies and talking to them. Um, I can tell you, you know, one specific specific example uh, was a company in New York City um, that was considering expansion either in place there in New York or down here in Sarasota. And we ran a number of these reports and put the infographics together and we put that in front of the executive team there. Um, and just having the, the, again, storytelling, easy to digest, quick and impactful data right in front of them, uh, I think truly moved the needle and helped them, you know, clear the fog of the business case. Um, and anytime you can mitigate that uncertainty and give quality intelligence, that's gonna influence a decision. And in this instance, that technology company did, in fact, um, expand and locate an office here in Sarasota County and is, is growing rapidly, even as of today, even through 2020 and all the, the challenges it's presented. Great, Dustin. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're just a couple minutes before our time is up. I am going to turn it back to Ron. Oops, sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen for the last couple of slides. And just want to really want to walk you through some of the key takeaways for the session. And this slide was written before we had the survey results, so they're not included in the slide, but hopefully you got the takeaways from the survey results. First, as Keith highlighted at the opening of the session, location intelligence is really a critical component of economic development strategy, and it means so much more than simply site selection now with current uh, data and technology. 
Lastly, we hope this session has illustrated to you that GIS technology is now simple and easy to use. You've heard again and again and again during the course of our discussion today how you don't need to be a GIS expert to use these tools. But I think uh, what the survey really confirmed is that GIS is still just in its early stages of being applied to economic developers and economic development. In other words, economic developers are really just beginning to take full advantage of the capabilities. And then a major point of the discussion today through uh, really all of the, the different agenda items was the inclusion of local data. That differenti differentiates your community, allows you to tell your story. GIS, to, uh, GIS technology now enables that in multiple ways. We've really just touched the surface of, of this as well today, but it's a critical component. And then lastly, we believe, and we hope today's session has convinced you that economic developers that leverage GIS technology now have a distinct advantage and can create advantage for their communities in attracting and growing uh, local businesses. Okay, last slide is contact information. We promised this earlier. Please feel free to reach out to any of today's participants, any of the folks whose emails and phone numbers you see on the screen. We'd be happy to answer any additional questions you have or help in any way we can. And I'd like to thank our participants today. I'd particularly like to thank Natalie Veal from Esri who managed the logistics of the whole webinar and thank especially all of you for attending. Thank you, Ron. Thanks everyone. Thank you.